Thou art diseased in understanding and religion, come to me, that thou mayst hear the tidings of sound truth. I went vegan without knowing any other vegans, but at least I had the internet. Imagine going vegan a thousand years ago. Do not unjustly eat what the water has given up, and do not desire as food the flesh of slaughtered animals. So wrote Abul Ala al Ma'ari, a lone poetic voice for veganism at the end of the Islamic Golden Age. He is a kindred spirit from a long time ago, but within this tradition. We solar scientists need some help to appreciate poetry. So we've traveled to one of the universities of London, Brunel, to another vegan rebel poet. With the story of Al-Ma'ari, from the academies of Baghdad to a medieval argument about animals, I mean McDonald's. I'm Diana Fleischman and our special guest is Benjamin Zephaniah. <laughs> this is the free-thinking medieval Middle Eastern rebel poet, Vegan Option. Baghdad changed Al Ma'ari's life, so let's join him as he arrives. He'd travelled to the world city to, to meet the greatest minds of the age and hopefully join them. He's in his mid-thirties, blind since childhood smallpox, and, and probably accompanied with a servant. He's been travelling from the fringes of the Abbasid Caliphate, from his home a thousand kilometres away in northwest Syria, where he was already an accomplished poet. And that's over 600 freedom units for... Those using the imperial system. He's yet to write about animals and, frustratingly, manuscripts contradict on whether he had yet gone vegan. Perhaps he's met Janes, perhaps not, we don't know. It's kind of hard for people to imagine, and sometimes it's even hard for me to imagine, because of what we hear about places like Baghdad now. Yeah. We think of it as like a war zone and a place where it's actually backwards, he says, in inverted commas. This was the place to go for knowledge. It's it, it's difficult to imagine like cafes and parlours where people would just sit and just talk politics and talk poetry. Well, I spoke to cultural historian Richard Fultz about the, 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 the culture of poetry at the time. Well, as I say, he was living at the tail end of what uh, I guess you could in a romantic way uh, refer to as kind of the golden age of Islamic civilization. He was roughly contemporary with the uh, you know, people like Avicenna, and uh, you really, you really couldn't reach a a, a more prestigious position in, in 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 the world than being known as a as a poet. It was really the summit of literary and, and cultural achievement, and also the potential for fame. Of course, you know, we didn't have television or the internet or anything like that. And and, and the way, the best way to circulate your ideas uh, in, in 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 a world where most people couldn't read was to be uh, quotable. And the best way to be quotable was to, you know, compose verses that were memorable and that people, you know, wanted to, uh, you know, wanted to share. Poetry in that day and age um, had an importance that, you know, goes far beyond what we might imagine uh, for poets today. I mean, I, I don't know how many of us could even name, uh, you know, ten uh, major living poets. Um, but in the culture we're talking about, and precisely because it was still predominantly an oral culture, um, poetry was really seen as the almost the definition of culture itself. I mean, my great love is the romantic poet Shelley Keats and Byron. I mean, they were like superstars. But once upon a time, it was a poet that was right up there. They were using words and they were stringing words together that really connected with people. And as you were just saying, were really quotable and memorable. They were the only ones, really. I mean, this was when the oral tradition was alive, and people must remember the oral tradition is a lot older than the written one. Poets were the rock stars of their day. Al Ma'ari was known uh, for his prodigious memory. There were there are incredibly apocryphal stories of him performing miraculous feats of memorization. In a lot of his poems, you can see off him showing off how much he remembers mm. of other people's poetry, and that plays. Of other people's big, poetry as yes. well, not just his own. Mm. Wow. So, we've got this city of literary salons, academies, public poetry recitals in the mosque. The literary circle of Baghdad were impressed by his poetry, his biting and erudite wit, and accepted him. But as Victorian historian David Magoliuth wrote, 
he stubbornly refused to take payment for favourable verse. This refusal to write verse professionally was doubtless deserving of respect, uh, but Abulala was probably defeating thereby the object with which he went to Baghdad, for there were the roads towards obtaining the means of supporting himself at Baghdad may have been open to him. That which he refused to follow was the most certain. So he refused mm. to take any sponsorship mm. to write verse. I f again, I find that really amazing, because um, one of the things that poets have done throughout the ages and I mean that throughout the ages, he struggled to earn a living. <laughs> you, know. you see all these um, paintings of saints, and then you'll see worshippers at their feet, and the worshippers are actually rich patrons. They're actually yeah. portraits of rich patrons. Yeah. And so, so many um, patrons of the arts have been either the church, religion, or um, you know the wealthy uh, uh, royalty and aristocracy. In Africa and the Caribbean, we have something called praise poets, and that's what they do. You know, their job is to praise the king or somebody, and that's they spend their life doing. Wow. This is the greatest thing that ever lived. <laughs> and look at him, look at his jewels, look at his wife. Look at, um, and that's what they do. But look, I mean, I couldn't be a praise poet. And the reason why I couldn't be a praise poet is because I believe that the poet should be a free thinker. The poet should be able to criticise left, right and centre. So I want to be a free agent, and I got a feeling that this is my, this could have been what was in his mind, that he didn't want to be attached to anybody. Worse, after his obscure insult during an argument about poetry, he fell out with a powerful Nakib family. They had him dragged out of the salon by his feet. So mm. even <laughs> in massively falling out with the mm. most powerful, one of the most powerful people in Baghdad, he is showing his erudition. So, um, that was a big reason for Al Ma'ari getting out. The other big reason was that he got news that his mother was seriously ill. So he had to start the 600 mile plus journey back to Marat. In the last days of his journey, he got news that his mother hadn't made it and has died before he got there. He sent a letter ahead of him and and we have that letter. My soul did not consent to my returning, so I had promised it three things. Seclusion as complete as that of the star Alphanique in the constellation of the bull. Separation from the world like that of the eggshell from the chick. And to remain in the city, even though its inhabitants fled through fear of the Greeks. What I wanted was to stay in a place of learning, and I found out the most precious of spots. But fate did not allow me to stay there, and only a fool will quarrel with destiny. But he didn't manage to go into seclusion. I mean, there were reports that he set up shop in a cave, but it still became the mo that cave still became the most famous site <laughs> in in in, in, in Marat. A really popular cave. Yes, <laughs> and, and we I mean, we call him Al Ma'ari. We call him the bloke from Marat. Mm. So the leading lights of the day had accepted him as one of their own, and students, disciples. Other scholars now flocked to hear his lectures. He became a major public figure, meeting and, and writing letters to from other people, and, and continuing to write poetry. I can understand him trying to get on in the world and going, well, you know, it's not working. Yeah. You know, these people don't understand me. And even if he goes to a retreat, he goes and lives in a cave, and the cave becomes a popular place where people come into him. He can still think they're coming for the wrong reasons, you know, they're still not quite yeah. understanding me, they're still yeah. not quite getting it. When he was in the cave, was he a vegan? Yes. Now he's writing poems about animals and other biographers are, are writing about his, what they call his ascetic diet. At that time, uh, the maiden poetic form was the ode, mm. rugged, adventurous, heathen. Uh, predefined and the tinder spark was quite uh, a traditional work and actually was more popular than his later works we're mm. slightly more interested in his later works because they talk about veganism and they break the rules and and his first collection uh, was called the unnecessary necessities because he put upon himself so many needless rules of grammar mm. and rhyming um, for the sake of it. He was kind of showing off about how well he could write poetry within wow. these like strict strict rules. 
أبهت لشأني قبل شيب المسائه Sounds a bit like reggae لا 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 Yeah I can back to that That was Alma Ari making the case for veganism in a poem sometimes called I Do Not Steal From Nature And you really want me to read it? Well, we would like you to, but if you, you, the, your reaction just now makes it sound like you don't want to. So you <laughs> Well, I mean, I don't even read my own poems on a page. I'm really dyslexic. Oh, really? So, uh, okay. Let me see. Thou art disease in understanding and religion. Come to me, that thou mayest hear the tidings of sound truth. Do not unjustly eat what the water has given up. Thou art diseased in understanding and religion, come to me, that thou mayst hear the tidings of sound truth. Do not unjustly eat what the water has given up, and do not desire as food the flesh of slaughtered animals. Of the white milk of mothers who intended its pure draught for their young, not for noble ladies, and do not grieve the unsuspecting birds by taking their eggs for injustice is the worst of crimes. And spare the honey which the bees get betimes by their industry from the flowers of fragrant plants. For they did not store it that it might belong to others. Nor did they gather it for bounty and gifts. Perfect. I think it's absolutely amazing poem. I mean, I wonder how odd it seemed because as I travel through um, some parts of Africa and some parts of Asia and I've even found this in Jordan that you say to people you're a vegan, are there vegans here? and they go no, what is a vegan? and then you tell them what a vegan is and they go oh there's a tribe of people like that down there hmm. They just don't have the word for vegan. Even in the English language, vegan is a modern word. I talked to cultural historian Richard Fultz and also Ghazal Anwar, a, a Muslim vegan, uh, about, uh, about where he may have got that idea from. So, yeah, it is a very interesting question where he got this idea. Um, there was an article came out more than 100 years ago by a German scholar who um, suggested that he may have come uh, into contact with... Uh, some uh, uh, some some uh, Jaina writings, and that's, that's certainly not implausible, especially when he was in Baghdad, because of course, um, the, you know, the, the the Middle East was very very connected to South Asia. That would that would be the most likely explanation of of how he got his particular ideas. But of course, um, some similar ideas had existed from ancient times uh, in some schools of Greek philosophy as well, and. And these Greek schools were very, very well known and very diligently studied by um, uh, Muslim philosophers uh, right up to Maari's time. Well, well, it certainly would have been a very unusual position to take uh, in, in, in his society. Um, there were Muslim vegetarians, uh, mostly Sufis, who, as far as I can tell, adopted vegetarianism less out of interest for uh, animals than for uh, sort of uh, their own spiritual purification practices along with um, other kinds of self-denial. So it was really about the, 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 the person, you know, uh, the advancing the spiritual goals of a person rather than caring about uh, the welfare of animals. So, so he, he seems to be somewhat exceptional in that way in that it seems pretty clear that uh, a major motivation for him really was that he was concerned about animal suffering and um, the interests of, of, of animals. I'm Ghazala Anwar. Um, I am a Muslim from birth and I teach Quranic studies. You can find his poetry in any of the libraries in the universities in Saudi Arabia, which, you know, which is a very repressive government as such, but he, his literary excellences was recognized and he's seen, you know, he is seen as a mystic as well by some. There's always been a stream of veganism in Tasawwuf, in Muslim Tasawwuf, Sufism. And you can even now, if you go to a bazaar in Pakistan and you buy a sort of a how-to book on Tasawwuf, which is book of prayers and vigils, 
it is clearly stated in this. The precondition is not eating any meat, not even using, any, not using any leather, and it goes on to not even having, you know, not having any milk, no animal products, even even to the extent of uh, honey. He could have gotten the idea from Indian Jains, ancient Greeks, or Sufi mystics. His writing also reflected his scepticism about religion. When somebody wrote complaining of their old age and simultaneously listing merits they suspected of heresy, he wrote an epistle of forgiveness in which his opponent died, travelled to heaven, met the heathen poets there. <laughs> um, and in some of his quatrains he seems thoroughly Islamic, but in others he praises rationalism over any revealed faith, and both Muslims and atheists. Uh, claim him as one of their own. He has a verse that says Islam does not have a monopoly on truth, which I think about, you know, with the the stereotype of Islam today, and it seems that at that point in time, there was a lot of tolerance towards people who um, were Muslims but didn't necessarily agree with um, all of the standard um, teachings. And he lived in a religiously mixed area. There were lots of Christians in his town. Mm. He was next to the Byzantine Empire. Yeah. So I think I read one of his poems where he talks about the Jews and the Sarastians. And yeah, that's right. What does he say? There's two kinds of men, uh, one with religion, uh, and no, one, one without religion and, and with intelligence, and, and yeah. one with, with religion and no intellect, which I have to say is pretty, uh, pretty sharp. I felt he was, I, I, I felt a, a little bit of anger when I read that, but maybe, you know, yeah. just ranting a little bit. He's very... Um, and some of his poem is very ranty. At near the end of his life, the chief missionary of Cairo, in charge of recruiting converts to the Ismaili Muslim faith, anonymously wrote him a letter and said, I want to hear the sound tidings of sound truth. <laughs> what is your ground for abstaining from meat, milk and all other animal products, as though they were unlawful? Your doctrine is disproved by the fact that we see before us various beasts and birds of prey, created by God in forms which are only compatible with carnivorous habits, involving the tearing of animals and the devouring of them. This fact being well established in creation, Mankind may well be excused for eating meat. Um, yeah, I was going to say, I mean, that's kind of mild to some of the things I hear. Yeah. I mean, there are some, I lived in Egypt for a couple of years and in, in, in some other areas where not eating meat is seen as an insult to God. God gave us the animals to eat. You are rejecting his gifts. Wow. That's the way they put it. <laughs> so, so it's even heavier than that and I've, I've had to confront that. His response sounds very contemporary. Hence, professedly religious persons have at all times been anxious to abstain from meat, because it cannot be obtained without causing pain to animals, which at all times shun pain. Think of the ewe, domesticated and with young. When she has borne the lamb and it has lived a month or thereabout, they kill it and eat it, and want her milk. And the ewe spends the night bleating, and would run in quest of it if she could. I believe too that restraining myself to a vegetable diet would secure my health, and doubtless you have looked into the ancient works and sayings ascribed to Galen and others, which show that the authors believe the soundness of this regime. And if it be said that the Creator is loving and merciful, then why does he suffer the lion to dispatch a human being who is neither mischievous nor cruel? This may sound kind of pompous, but there's so much that he says that I just, I, I think that's just like me, you know? <laughs> I mean, I've always said that my veganism comes from a mixture of the love for the animals and also health as well. It started with the love for the animals and then later on I kind of began to appreciate the, the health. I asked you a personal question about your reason for abstaining from the meat which strengthens the body and produces flesh. And you give me an answer of which I can only say, are these the utterances of a sound mind? Are these the utterances of sound wits? With regard to your assertion that meat cannot be procured without infliction of pain on animals, that 
has already been answered. You need not be kinder to them than their creator. I've been there. Yeah, I've been there and, you know, Egypt. and in Egypt. I've been there. There's just like, I've had people say to me, I've had a person say to me in Egypt as we kind of was sitting on the Nile, said, if you don't eat meat, if you don't have milk, how do you make love to a woman? <laughs> Where do you get the strength from? <laughs> You know, <laughs> and it's Collapse. serious, you know, they're, they're very, very serious about asking these questions. For religious men have at all times abstained from things which in themselves are lawful for them. Now it is well known that when the calf is killed, the cow pines for it and keeps awake whole nights on its account. Its flesh is eaten and the milk that it should have sucked is lavished on its mother's owners. What harm then can there be in abstaining from killing the calf? and declining to use the milk. Such a man need not suppose it to be unlawful. He only abstains out of religious fervour and mercy towards the victim, and in the hope that he may be compensated for his abstinence by the Creator's forgiveness. And if it be said that the Almighty distributes his gifts equally between his servants, then what sins has the victim committed that they should be excluded from his mercy? The problem is, when we talk about things rationally, this makes sense of us, we've worked this out or whatever. It's very difficult for somebody who says, I don't care about your rationality, God said. Mm -hmm. You can't go and talk to God and say, you know, what do you say on this? The mission replied one last time, explaining that he'd been expecting some mystical secrets and apologising for wasting Al Ma'ari's time. An old story circulated for centuries that the missionary had had Alma Ari tried for heresy, but the real letters end amicably. I want to end this with, with his death, because there was a nice story about that. The, the famous physician in Babutlan attended him, and as he was fading, in his 80s, mm. he asked for pen and paper for somebody to record something, and he started to make a grammatical mistake. <laughs> And the physician said, he's already dead. Um, <laughs> it's, um, it was the only time he was going to make a grammatical mistake was on his deathbed. Wow. Yeah. Well, that says it all, really. <laughs> that really does... Uh, oh. Thank all. you so... Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much for joining <laughs> us. Well, it's been really interesting. It's just, it's, again, it's just one of those stories you hear and you think this story has to be told more. And thank you to Rob Masters for Music... Mutaz Al Shahal for the Arabic poetry, and Will Trimble and Ian Peacock for dramatically playing the parts. There's more about Alma Ari, including links to books by and about him, at theveganoption.org. The Vegan Option is copyright us. Please follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and give us deservedly awesome reviews on iTunes, including telling other people about us. Mm -hmm.